hands up everyone in the room who has a teenage child. Thank you. Hands up everyone in the room who has a preteen child. Okay, I'm not, to those who raised your hands and to those who didn't, I'm not going to be delivering a session on teenage parenting that Google thoughtfully provided. As a very challenging teenager myself, this is me at 15, probably not as challenging as Shane, but still pretty challenging. As a challenging teenager, I would be loath to offer any parents teenage parenting advice, but I am gonna be focusing today on teenagers for two reasons. First, and I'm speaking to all as business people here, because they represent a very significant market worth 100 billion euros, and this is in Africa, the Middle East, and Europe combined. And second, because if you want to plan for the success of your business over the next two decades, you need to deeply understand this generation and understand how profoundly different they are to previous ones. And I'm saying this as an economist who has a pretty good track record of predicting economic, business, and political trends. As somebody who works with companies who seek to get better insights into this generation and engage with them, and also as somebody who carries out proprietary research into this demographic. Most recently, a study of 2,000 teenagers in the United Kingdom and the US. So, what do we know about this generation? A generation I call Generation K. First, we know, of course, that they have been profoundly shaped by technology. Super social, permanently on, multitasking, multi-screening. If first era millennials came to the technology party early, this generation, Generation K, doesn't even remember an era pre-digital. But technology is not, of course, the only force that has shaped them. This generation has been shaped by two other forces. By the global recession, by a world of economic challenge that they have lived through. This is the generation that has lived through the worst recession the West has seen in decades. A generation who has lived through a period of protracted youth unemployment in many countries. Is there anyone in the room from Spain or Portugal or Greece? No. You know all too well how current and recent economic conditions are affecting this generation. It's a generation that is used to financial instability and lacks financial optimism. And it's also a generation that has been scarred by this world of existential danger and threat that they experience. This is the generation that have grown up in the wake of 9-11, the London and Madrid bombings, Al-Qaeda, the rise of ISIS, this generation has had brutality, extremism, danger piped into their smartphones in ways we have never before experienced. And it's this particular configuration of forces, this combination of three forces that are so distinct, I believe, that has shaped this generation, a generation I call Generation K after Katniss Everdeen the heroine of the global franchise, The Hunger Games. Because unlike for the first era millennials, for whom the world was their oyster, for this generation, the world is less oyster, more Hobbesian nightmare, dystopian, unequal, harsh. So how is this manifesting? Well, first, what we see is that this generation is profoundly anxious. 
And I'm not just talking about the typical teenage anxieties of boyfriends, girlfriends, homework, peer pressure, parents, although those are amplified, of course, through social media. But I'm talking here about really worried about big existential threats, about climate change that Shane just talked about, about terrorism. 70% of this generation are worried about terrorism, but also very worried about how their own futures are going to manifest. 79% of teenagers are very worried about getting a job. 72% are very worried about getting into debt. Teenagers, 14, 15 year olds, worried about getting into debt, but they are. This generation is also profoundly distrustful of traditional institutions. This is the percentage of adults who trust big corporations to do the right thing. What percentage of Generation K trusts, adult, uh, trusts big corporations to do the right thing? Six percent. The social contract between corporations and teenagers has completely broken down, but it is not irrevocable. How to regain and rebuild it is something I will come back to later. This generation may be called the selfie generation, but it's important to realize that they're not actually selfish. It's a generation that is passionate about volunteering, about campaigning, about giving money to charity more so than other generations. It's a generation that refuses to be the passive victim of the future that we have bequeathed to them. Instead, they are determined to be agents for change, actively co-creating a better future for all of us. And they are profoundly concerned about inequality. In fact, out of all their concerns, all their worries, and we know that they are very anxious, one of the things they are most concerned about is inequality. Gender inequality, racial inequality, economic inequality, transgender inequality. 80% of this generation support transgender rights. It's also a generation that cherishes its individualism, cherishes its ability to put its own version of itself out there. When I asked in my recent study of 2,000 teenagers, for the teenagers to give me just one word to describe themselves, unique was the word they most commonly used. As Sarah, 16, explained to me, for me, it's about being myself. It's about wearing the clothes I want to wear. It's about saying the things I want to say. It's about expressing myself truthfully. Unique distrustful, anxious, socially committed. These, I believe, are four of the key defining traits of this generation. So, so what, what are the implications of this to you in the room? What are the implications to you as marketers, employers, or custodians of your company's future legacies? Let me just make four suggestions. First, if you are to deeply connect with this generation, you will need to embody their values in an authentic way. This means taking a stance on the social, environmental, and ethical issues that they are so passionate about, and doing it in a real and meaningful way. A great example is Johnson & Johnson which recently chose transgender teen Jazz Jennings to be the front of their Clean and Clear campaign. Another example, Mark Benioff, this CEO of Salesforce, who just announced last month that he is going to comb through 16,000 employee records to check that there are no pay differentials between men and women, and if there are, redress the imbalances. 
connecting with them in an authentic way. I can't overstate the importance of being authentic. It's about walking the talk. It's about putting your neck on the line. It's about being committed to be agents for change yourselves. Anything less, and you risk being outed by generations skeptical. The second insight when you're trying to engage with this generation is that it's absolutely critical to be transparent. Transparent nowadays isn't a smart strategy. I would argue it's a necessary strategy. And I've been reflecting upon this. Um, you know, when I think about why companies so often get this wrong, and I think companies often make a mistake because they think that they have to be perfect before they shine the spotlight on themselves or their in-house counsel tells them they need to be. But with this generation, I believe that is a failing strategy. This generation doesn't demand perfection. It just demands honesty and openness. And when you're thinking about what I know is a very hot topic at the moment, um, the use of customers' data, I think it's important to bear this in mind. And I wanted to highlight data because this generation, there is a myth that this generation doesn't care about privacy. That this generation who posts and shares you know, very intimate details about their lives doesn't care about privacy. Completely wrong. I would argue that this generation is the most privacy conscious generation out there. 79% restrict their privacy settings. The majority have used a fake identity online. It's not that they won't give up privacy for anything. No, they understand that they can have better user experiences in exchange for giving up their data. It's just that they want the value exchange to be explicit. And they want to be able to opt out without impunity. Third, if you're to truly understand this generation, Generation K, it's essential to make sure that you're using the right tools to do so. I mean, how many millions of euros do you in this room spend every year on market research? In Europe, companies spend 16 billion euros every year on market research. But how much have you thought about whether the tools that are being used are fit for purpose for this generation? This generation have very different traits. They are much more creative, much more visual, have much shorter attention spans, are much less able to clearly verbalize. So when I work with clients on investigating this generation, we've come up with a whole special toolkit for figuring them out. When we do focus groups, we don't just do them in sterile rooms. No, we do them in chilled out apartments. We use games and art and music in order to tap into their subconscious beliefs and to tap into their desire to be creative. We, when we're thinking about our questionnaires, we use language that is their language and think very carefully about the atten their attention spans. We use biometric testing in order to identify the gaps between what they say and what they actually do. And finally, if you are to successfully engage with this generation, you need to do two things. You need to give them the opportunity to be part of your solution. Give them the opportunity to innovate and co-create alongside you. My company, because we focus on 13 to 30 year olds, we have an advisory board not made up of people like us, but of teenagers and young adults. We want their input, their insights. Get it right. Give them a platform to be expressive and be unique. And you'll also get the most incredible brand ambassadors. Did you know that you could go to Starbucks and order a mojito refresher? No, nor did I. It doesn't have alcohol in it, by the way. Um, but America's teenagers do. They have gone crazy for Starbucks' secret menu. This is one of their favorite concoctions. It's cotton candy frappuccino. They are sharing images on Instagram 
on Tumblr of their favorite drinks. They are sharing stories of their experiences with confused baristas. Genius. By giving, by facilitating a platform whereby teenagers can express themselves uniquely, Starbucks has gained a whole brand loyal cadre of brand ambassadors who don't even drink coffee. And you know what? In a world of economic downturn and continued global instability, I actually find cotton candy frappuccinos rather reassuring. Thank you.